Oh, it's doing oh, something. Live. Uh -oh. Right. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Connor from the Santa Barbara Startup Circle, one of the co organizers. And here I have Barbara Bickham, Alan Gorin, and Gary Livingston. So uh, if you could all go around and introduce yourselves and talk about uh, your experience with lean startups. So I'll go, I'll go first. Thank you, uh, Connor. I'm Barbara Bickham. Uh, I, I'm the founder and CTO at Trail and Ventures, and we put companies on blockchains. Uh, I'm also the managing partner at the Women's Innovation Fund and, and Accelerator. So we do three things there. We uh, accelerate and grow companies, emerging tech companies, blockchain, AI, or IoT. Uh, we have a gender balanced sea level, equal amount of men and women. We have a few more women than men, but we kind of like balance there. And then we use sustainability models in order to help them grow and scale. And we also use it inside of the fund as well. So that's me in a nutshell. My experience with Lean Startup. Um, wow. Uh, I'm a CTO, so I do work with a lot of companies that are starting from ideation. So very early and very late. But you can use Lean Startup inside of a well-established company as well if you are trying to innovate and modify what you're doing or migrate to more emerging tech, you can lose, use the same concepts of Lean Startup there as well. Uh, okay. I'll kick it to the next person. Okay. All right, so hey, um, I run an organization called 805 Startups. I happen to have a great co-founder in Alon Goran, who's, I don't know where he is positioned here, but. He's, He's in this amazing the call with us. And uh, yeah, so um, focus on trying to build economic ecosystems that activate everyone that's a part of the community around us and the economy. It doesn't matter what kind of business, what industry, what level of experience they are at. We all share in this community. So we should all be collaborating together. And that's the number one goal. We do a lot of events and programs designed around educating, inspiring, and fostering authentic relationships between people, all with that goal in mind. Uh, background is pretty diverse from photography, managing bands, putting on lots of different events before I started working with Alon on 805 Startups, and experience design, whether that's UX or any kind of experience, whether that's like, you know, designing an experience around an event or a physical product, doesn't matter. Same framework, same purpose. And when you're doing that, you need to be lean when you first start. You don't want to be putting too much of your money and time into something that is unvalidated. So you want to start lean and test as much as you can and make sure that you're on the right path. Yeah, so that's the gist of me. Hi, everyone. I'm Alon. Uh, like Gary said, I, I started 805 Startups a long time ago, and um, he has taken it over and made it into something much, much bigger and cooler now. Um, and. Uh, you know, I'm I'm an early uh, stage techie myself. I now have a uh, venture uh, studio, is what we call it, uh, Draper Gorin Home, where we um, we accelerate and incubate early stage blockchain startups. Um, but for me, lean startups, um, you know, I think that that lean startups like methodology or whatever the heck it was called when it first came out for most startup people was like a no shit kind of thing um because like the whole point of a an internet startup is to be able to globally scale a company from like from your house like we are right now like there's the whole idea of doing startups that are like capital intensive and require things like there's people that create incredible really awesome startups with like you know, actual physical technology, hardware, and stuff like that. And yeah. It seems insane to me because the whole point of sort of being an, an internet uh, techie entrepreneur type of person is to be able to scale globally with like two people locked in a mop closet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, but I think the whole you know methodology of of like what Gary kind of just alluded to and touched on is is super important, right? Like. Back in the day when we were first starting tech companies, it was really, really fun thing to see if you could get people to the point of putting in their credit card number to buy mm -hmm. something and then yeah. having some pop up that either said like, hey, just kidding, we're in private beta um, or uh, or saying something like we ran out of stock, like 
come back next week and, and we'll let you know. Don't worry, we didn't charge your card. And, and things like that became sort of almost like a part of, of this methodology that, that people put together. But early internet entrepreneurs used to do that just so that they could see if there was even a reason to build the product they were thinking about building, because what's the point of building something if, if nobody's going to, uh, to buy it? Um, we all know really, really smart engineers that build epic stuff that, that has no market. Right. So, I think I'm, I'm totally, totally diverted, but uh, I, 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 probably have I, I do. I do love that you brought up that example because it's something that I constantly am telling people to do and mentoring people, whether it's eight to five startups or so like I also uh, moderate startups on Reddit. And so there's a number of people that are trying to figure out what is going on and how to, you know, pursue this whole, this whole crazy world of startups. And yeah, they're often trying to validate and prove that they're on the right path with their product by running surveys. And they're posing these hypothetical questions to people. And you're like, it doesn't do anything. Go and try to see if you can get a sale. Even if it's like right. not a real thing, like, Even if it's use a a con yeah, just use a contact form and see if someone's willing to try to put in their contact information, their, their credit card information, see what happens. But we can talk a lot more on that. But yeah, I just love yeah. that you brought that up. Yeah, like sign signups for a newsletter is something, but it's not, mm -hmm. doesn't equate uh, having a business yet, you know? So. To totally, totally agree. You got to get, you've got to like indicate that, that people can, uh, yeah. Like Robin just posted in the chat, uh, MVP and, everything 1000% one, one before true MVP, true. you can find out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like the key thing that people kind of need to remember is what MVP stands for minimum mm -hmm. viable product. You need to have a product that's viable enough that people are willing to pay for it. And if you're right. running something that's free, it still needs to be viable enough as a product for them to continuously use it and get some benefit out of that experience. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, and I, 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 I'm glad you brought that up, Gary, because I had this wonderful, great presentation, but we'll just kind of wing it on that one. So if you think about MVP and what the concept of that is, and the concept of that inside of Lean Startup, Lean Startup says build, measure, learn, and then you keep iterating, iterating, iterating. But the learn piece and the measure piece are really based upon those people that are outside of your traditional network. So if your friends are doing it, that's great. But, you know, they have less expectation than if you've gone like in a wider circle to like more generalized people. And those are the people that really are going to tell you, is this viable? Uh, is this a valid market? Is it, you know, is the price really correct, even if it's a dollar? Um, because free, there's no inherent value in free. I always say that. But then, too, if from a technological perspective, monetizing that free is very difficult. People are like, oh, I'm going to get 500, you know, 1,000, a million users, and then we'll just sell all the data. I think those days are kind of gone. Um, and I don't know, like, what investors are even looking at that kind of model anymore. I think in the beginning, you have to be thinking about in your MVP, P also should be price, minimum viable price. Like what yeah. is the, the, the actual monetization that somebody's willing to pay for your product? So you, you hit on two things that I want to comment on real quick. First, sure. that, that whole kind of fallacy of turning to your own, your own network and looking to them to be kind of like, you know, your early adopters, because it's, it's, it's even more dangerous than that low expectation that they have. It's more the fact that they might just simply feel obligated mm -hmm. to make you feel safe and happy and good that they, that they are interacting with something that you built. Right. So, right. so there's that whole little, like, you know, kind of like fluffy boundary, that well, we used they, to always, like, you know, live within that. In the crowdfunding world, we also we used to also say like like you can't start at zero also because if right. you can't get like your mom, your sister, your brother, your cousin to support your campaign, then you're dead in the water. Like if you yeah. can't even get that, so that should be the easiest you know person yeah. to convert, right? The people that support you. Then yeah. then you know that's like the lowest hurdle. 
Yeah, and then uh, I agree, then, but then, I agree with you though too, Gary. Like you know, if that's the only bar you have, then you know, kind of yeah. kind of a problem because other, like, what honest feedback are you really going to get? Yeah, and it, that's the thing. Like you know, that that feedback that comes from them is also wrapped in so much bias mm -hmm. based on the relationship you have with them. It might be someone that's like you know an overbearing type of parent that wants to coddle you, or it could be the opposite, a different kind of parent that no matter what you do isn't good enough, right? And so you're dealing with these extremes based on that existing relationship that you have. But the other thing too that was really important that you said was minimum viable price. Because you can't have a product without a price. The whole purpose of a product is to have a business. You build a business around a product. Therefore, you need a business model and you need uh -huh. some form of monetization to support that business, right? So those are really, really great, great insights that you just shared. Connor, we're yeah, kind of running that, away, man. Sorry, Where do you want to go with that? Was uh, was like the about, um, presentation, which uh, was about. Oh, sorry, Connor. Hey, okay. I know it's like uh, crossover. <laughs> sorry, we got a crossover. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, what have you seen? I think Barbara, you spoke about that model where you know you start at no price, then you just monetize the data later. But that maybe uh -huh. isn't working as much recently. What yeah. types of models have you seen work recently? Well, I mean. All the traditional models work. SaaS models work. B two B models are longer sales cycles. Um, you know the recurring revenue models work. It's harder to do a model now, but everybody I think has subscription fatigue at some levels as well. So how many you know subscriptions are you going to maintain as an individual? That's that's a whole another conversation in a B two C model. Um, I've seen B two B to C. So like. OK, I'm going to partner with somebody that then is going to distribute my product or OEM my product or white label my product. I've seen those models. Um, Can you, you elaborate know, on that and explain? The models still yeah. work as well. Hey, I'm going to go to XYZ, a large company, and they can license my software. I've seen that as well. So very traditional models. Is that the models haven't evolved that much. It's just a matter of how many revenue streams can you create? And I'm not saying like, if you had a million users and they were all paying you money, then that might be worth something to an advertiser because you have a little bit more information uh, than, because if you think about back in the day or even now, when we swipe our card at the grocery store, we enter our little card at the grocery store, they know like what we purchased. So like, you know, we are paying for groceries and they have a lot of data on our purchasing patterns. Well, can you imagine if, you know, hey, I'm paying, you know, as a lean startup, hey, I've got, you know, even a thousand or two thousand people. I understand their purchasing patterns in this area. Like that's a very powerful conversation to have with someone. Well, yeah, one thousand percent. I also think that in this day and age, if we're talking lean coronavirus time, like we, we focus on like this exact moment in time. I think in general, any model that can keep the startup going and alive is mm -hmm. important. I think that like yeah. we're gonna it's gonna yeah. be harder than ever and we think it's bad now. Like I, I really do think that uh, that people uh, were sort of underestimating how long this could potentially last. Like not in terms of like all being locked at home, but the the ramifications of taking a major hit. And um, you know maybe i hope not i hope that we we can recover way faster because we kind of can like once something does happen we can all come back to it mm -hmm. but historically that's not what happens after huge collapses of the economy and so what the the people who are going to be hardest hit are probably like the seed stage earliest startup people like it's right. going to be people who have like a series a startup that already have a product that have customers and things like that that are making some money We'll have to lower their valuations or expectations or things like that, but I think they'll continue to be able to raise money. But I think that like when it's the you know two co-founders with an idea, you're gonna have to like execute like 10x what you would have had to before to get your seed round. And so if you can come up with a model, if you can set your own personal life up to be able to you know overcome that hurdle, um, then you're gonna win. You know, there's um, uh, uh, Boost VC, the startup accelerator, and by Adam Draper has this saying. It's called "Be the cockroach," and it sounds kind of stupid and silly when you just say it. But if you look it up and their idea of it, it's because they've had multiple companies. They've now done, you know, like hundreds of companies have gone through their accelerator, 
And they've realized that companies that could live with like no revenue or no fundraising and can make it through tough times. Mm -hmm. And because every startup hits these roller coasters, the companies that make it through those tough times have had in the end a very, very high likelihood of success. But every company hits those hurdles and then some of the companies die when they hit those hurdles. Some of those companies, you know, uh, fall apart. You know, some of those companies fizzle out and then some of those companies are able to, you know, keep rocking or keep their co-founders going and going and going until the till the right moment arrives, right? And right. then you take off. So well, and the, the other thing in this COVID nineteen um, era, I'll I'll just call it an era or, or time the short frame time frame, is like how do you reposition your company for the longer term? It doesn't matter if you have an idea or you're later. Uh, you know, seed series A, you know, series B, you're probably super fine. But, um, you know, even series A, I think I've seen a few of those types of companies struggling because they weren't in the right industry or the right kind of niche. So how do you kind of re rejig yourself? You know, now you have to kind of lean start up yourself again and go, okay, how do I make sure I position myself properly? and you know kind of reconfigure myself with my investors with my customers with my vendors so they know like we're still going on and still an operating concern as well yeah there's a couple you things going on I'm, exactly. yeah there's a couple things going on and like alon like you touched on it, it's much much bigger than the economic impact of what's going on right now and you and i we've talked about this before where everyone right now is experiencing immense mental trauma as a result of being isolated, being being threatened by this, this pandemic and a number of other different things. And mm -hmm. that sort of like trauma, it doesn't go away easily. It doesn't go away quickly. And, you know, like the, the larger implications of how we as a society react to this and the economy reacts to this is gonna be a long-term, very uncertain thing. And so, yeah, like all of us, need to be changing our mindset and our approach to things we need to yeah be the cockroach in the sense of how can i adapt how can i innovate and how can i like really like you know position myself and my business in a, in a into a way where i can survive this and i mean like you know me i love to use like sports analogies and everything and a lot of what we do is based around looking at like very very successful dynasties in sports right. and when you look at championship teams it goes back to how they handle adversity, right? Mm -hmm. And anyone that's successful has a different mindset in how they are, uh, how they approach adversity when it comes their way, and how they see it as a challenge and not as a, you know, a, a, um, a hurdle that can't be overcome, right? right? So, you know, it's it's definitely like a mindset. Uh, mm -hmm need to take the proper mindset first it doesn't matter yeah. what else is going on like you need to find a way to seek out opportunity and learn from what else is going on around you how others are dealing with it and finding success but then contextually plug in your unique factors that apply to yourself your team your business your industry your market and all that stuff and really like distill down what experience am i trying to provide people what is the benefit of that experience what can I do to build a product and service to still give people that experience and benefit in the leanest way possible? And that's where like, you know, getting back to the topic of the lean, right? You yeah. don't need to build something proprietary. You don't need to use a bunch of fancy tech. Mm -hmm. The last startup I was working on before joining forces with Elon, we were doing on-demand delivery service for restaurants. And when we first started selling that to restaurants, we had nothing. We had a simple contact form that was wrapped in phone gap that we presented to the <laughs> restaurants as a fancy app that they can use to request our delivery drivers come to their restaurant to pick up anything they need dropped off to one of their customers, uh -huh. right? And we told them it's got really cool algorithms and awesome software, cutting edge, but it didn't. It just emailed us the information in the contact form telling us all we need to know, restaurant, time to pick up where it's going that's it and right. then behind the scenes in our office few of us had a bunch of other walkie talkies and phones with a, a couple drivers that we had and we we're just manually doing a lot of this stuff by cobbling mm -hmm. existing things together to make our system work and our system as we continue growing 
we proprietary built software to run that system and right. automated a lot of that stuff without having to figure out, okay, uh, you know, all this other stuff. So like, you know, whatever you're doing, you can always get lean and test things out and try something, but you always need to be very cognizant of what experience do I want to give people? Mm -hmm. What's the benefit of that? And then build around that. I think, you know, I had this great presentation. So that comes back to the like business model canvas. So if you think about what the business model canvas does, yeah. it kind of gives you that idea. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, it gives you the idea of kind of what are those, what is your unique selling proposition? Who are those customers? Who are your key people? And it does have the revenue model at the bottom. Now, the one negative I don't like about the business model canvas is it's missing the competition piece because you really have to have that competitive thinking, like who really else is in my space? And I'm not saying don't do your idea. What I'm saying is understand your space, understand who else is in your space. And then like you said, Gary, there was a status quo way that was that the food delivery was being done yeah. and you disrupted that by adding like a technical piece to it. But you were still doing some things manually. And I worked with a company too. We did the same thing. We had a website. We entered in stuff. We knew where to deliver stuff. And, and like there was a lot of spreadsheets and other kind of manual stuff going on behind the scenes, Zapier and stuff. And so like that's that's how you do a lean startup. It's kind of like the build, like we said, build, measure, <laughs> learn, build, measure, learn. And then as you learn more, you add a little bit more because the thing you want to you want to evaluate on that side is like, hey, how do I go about making sure that I automate the right things as well? Because your process may not 100 percent be down either. No. Yeah. And I mean, like that, it's a constant cycle all yeah. the time. Like everyone needs to be approaching their projects, their their assumptions like a scientist as closely mm -hmm. as possible. It's just an ongoing series of experiments mm -hmm. and a lot of times too, like you're, you're not going to validate your assumptions. You're going to realize, Oh wait, that was not the case. That was completely off base. Right. I need to, I need to, I need to go back to the drawing board. Right. And in doing so that often highlights a lot of new opportunities that you didn't realize were there yet. And mm -hmm. you can often pivot. That's what the whole point of pivoting is, right? You find something more lucrative or more, uh effective or something easier to obtain and you go for that and you build around that but absolutely i mean like you know this this notion of uh approaching this sorry my brain just like totally just like crashed okay, right it happens. But, uh, yeah um it happens to me all the time you can build on that build on that <laughs> well i think i think that that you're you're absolutely right you can build on it everything is an experiment because yeah. there is no such thing as a study that, okay, I shouldn't say no such thing. 99.9% .9 of the time, what you build as a startup and what you th or and what you think you're going to build as a startup are completely different. Because oh, right. on day one, you haven't, you don't know, right? I, I remember building uh, in the last, you know, full time company that I launched, building the product and having this pipeline of feet. And after literally launching the product and seeing people use it, we realized that like our three features that took us weeks to build that we thought were the coolest freaking things in the whole world were never even touched by our customers. And so we were like, we spent a bunch of time trying to like basically market that to our customers and like show them, here's how to use it. Here's how to use it. And then it turns out nobody gave a crap because nobody wanted to use it, right? Like, it, so it didn't, it didn't matter. We thought it was cool. But, but nobody want to use it. So you don't know until you actually build it. Um, and and then going back to, to what Barbara said before about your competition and stuff like that. Like That's if where you, my brain was going. You need to, you, you have like two things, right? There's the people who go like, we don't have competition. That's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Right? That, that makes no sense. Because it's like, it's like okay, I'm creating uh make make something up. Like we, we deliver. We edible Play-Doh. Edible Play-Doh. And we, we deliver edible Play-Doh. There's no such thing. It's like, well, then your competition is food that actually tastes good that already, <laughs> right? Uh, it's not like there's no other edible Play-Doh Play companies. Like, okay, like there is. The kind that my mom makes on the stove when we're when I was in kindergarten, right? Whatever. 
but there is something today we do something right right if, if you know it's like saying like the competition for running is walking and riding your bike right like well i don't know uh, so, I mean, so yeah. anyway, and then the other flip side is there is competition they might suck in comparison to what you want to build but if you don't have all of their apps on your phone already and know how they work and know what's going on then you don't know you don't know that your product is actually better, right? Like you have this idea, right? You, the idea of your product, you don't know the idea of your product is better. You have yeah. an idea. Yeah, and you, yeah. so that's that's where my brain was going when it crashed and burned. So I, okay. absolutely. Okay. So when you're talking about when you're talking about, the, you you're talking about wear that hockey helmet more often. Yeah. <laughs> when you're talking about competitors, you need to research your competitors to learn what people are in the market already doing, what their entrenched behaviors are what their expectations are more than anything else. Okay. Because when you build something and you're trying to be super innovative and cool and different, if you're too far removed from what they find familiar, they're not going to adopt it. They're gonna to be too weirded out. It doesn't matter if it's a billion times better, more effective, more valuable in your mind, people will still be uncomfortable using it just on a subconscious level without realizing it because as they're going through the motions, it just, it feels off. and they'll just be like, I can't handle this. I don't want to deal with this, right? So you need to learn what these entrenched behaviors are, these, what these existing like you know expectations are with your market and who you're going after. The other thing too is again, I, I, I say this all the time, experience, benefit, value. I don't like framing things in the, in the sense of problem solution because it's so easy for someone to argue that's not a problem, that's not a real problem, right? But if you can, if you approach it as what's the experience, is there a benefit to that experience? What's the value of that benefit, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's it's near impossible to argue that sort of approach, and it makes it much easier for you to understand how to build around those goals and those tenets. Right. So, like when you research your competition, you learn what type of experience they're offering to the market, what exactly the benefits of that experience are, and what the value there is. That gives you a lot to to then go back to your own you know product, your own vision and understand more clearly how you're different, how you can better present in and position what your experience is and the benefits of that. And more than that, understand the value of it to the market and who's going to best benefit from that value. So you're not wasting your time trying to com compete with everyone in the market, right? You get super laser focused and you're like, look, I'm only going after this specific demographic and this hyper-focused psychographic. Psychographic is, you know, all the behavior patterns of a person, mm -hmm. which is far more valuable than the demographics. So in doing that, all of a sudden, you're able to get much leaner too, because you're more focused. You don't have to spend as much money, you don't have to put as much time into trying to market and gain all these users and customers and such. So yeah, there's my rant about competition. The, 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 you know, the, the analogy, okay. the easy analogy in there is, is Amazon, uh, right? Like Amazon didn't come out the gates going like, we're gonna sell everything in the whole freaking world on the internet, and we're gonna power the internet too. Just <laughs> we're you know, gonna make content not, on the internet as well. Yeah, they, they sold book, right? Like, right. No content like that. That idea that didn't really. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. didn't exist. Way later. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I worked at IMDb hmm. in. Uh, in, I don't know, like 2013 or so, 2012, 2013. Right, right. And we had a product called IMDb Theaters. And that's where you uploaded your movies if you were like a filmmaker to display it on your IMDb page or like trailers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that product eventually, I think, became like Amazon Video On Demand, which eventually became that. And it got rebuilt like 18,000 times. And I really didn't have anything to do with that, that product. But at the time, people who wanted to upload their films onto that site had major problems. Like just, so think about this, just seven years ago, six, seven years ago, it was a huge pain in the butt to, to just upload a, an HD movie onto the internet. Absolutely. People, like production companies would sometimes bring their computers into the office because we had a better internet connection than them. Like okay. this is just a problem that existed six years ago. Now we're like, I take you know 60 frame per second video on my phone and this is the old version of the yeah, phone. Okay. Four K video on the phone now. Yeah, yeah. And we, we record HD and we send it. It's like not even a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And we're all watching TV over the internet. It's a better experience than than the the cable company provides us, right? It's like so. 
the whole world changes so fast and and you have to you know it you're going to the there's going to be reiterations but the whole point of where i started there before i fully add'd away <laughs> was that you have to start somewhere and exactly what gary said is important like mm -hmm. okay you're going to launch a uh you're going to launch a tv channel right start with one show right make that show a hit make it amazing you know exactly who to target then later you can use that as the example for here's what i'm going to do with that investor money here's how i'm going to take the gasoline and throw it on the fire and blow the shit up but until then uh you don't know what the hell you're even talking about right yeah and i mean like and i always i always bring it up this way i always say look you know we're we have these phones we have iphones there was an iphone one now we're to what, iPhone 11? You know, so like things evolve. There, there's like a 1.0, then you get 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0. So, you know, like the fact that you think you have to have everything immediately is kind of a misnomer because nobody had everything immediately. That's yeah. kind of following up on your point, Alon. Like yeah. Amazon didn't have everything immediately. Apple didn't have it. Microsoft has evolved Windows 100,000 times. So like if you think about the evolution of software, um, you know, it evolves. Airbnb is a perfect example of what Alon spoke about earlier, which was kind of like, hey, we built this thing. People were using it in a different way. So they kind of migrated to that way that people were using it. So these things happen and you just have to be very um, agile and lean and be able to kind of migrate, evolve and, and build things and, and get things out there quickly in order to kind of innovate and survive. Yeah, it goes back to, again, the mindset. You need to have an open mindset to to change. You need to be willing to really just go with it and seize it and see it as an opportunity, not as something that's impeding you because change is inevitable. Like, no one saw this, like, pandemic coming, or at least, like, not enough people that, you know, should have. But, you know, like, we're mostly unprepared, and now we're in this terrible situation, right? But no one expected this. No one had this worked into, like, their business plans of, like, oh, wait, I've got this contingency plan ready to go for a pandemic. Now it's going to be something that everyone includes. Not this pandemic, global pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, like, you, you need to have this mindset that is willing to iterate, and it's got to be part of your process. And it's got to be something that is an open conversation, a dialogue that you're having with your intended customers. And at least like, you know, have multiple conversations when you're first getting started with different groups of customers, because you might not even be targeting the right ones. So you want to have like a couple like, you know, key groups that you think might be the best ones and then run these validation tests with them and see which ones return the highest value for your efforts put forth towards them. But I mean, like the Amazon thing, right? It's another good example of starting lean. How did, how did Be Bezos start Amazon, right? right? Then he just put up a random website and then he'd go to actual bookstores and then buy them and sell them. Wasn't yep. it like the same thing as like Zappos, Tony Shea, put mm -hmm. up a website to sell shoes. He'd go to the store, buy shoes, and then mail them to people that bought them from him, right? right. That's how you validate your assumptions that people are willing to engage in this experience that you're creating and then build from that, right? The most important thing to, to really like do first is test your hypothesis around the systems that you intend to create and if there's right. any value in that because technology is just a tool. People have been selling shoes and selling books and all this other crap for decades and decades before internet was ever invented. People are just doing it more efficiently now. That's all it is. So try to distill things down to like the most basic form of what your experience and benefit is and start there. You don't need to have a bunch of fancy technology to get a business going first. That could be version one, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. I think I think we uh uh Connor passed out. Um, <laughs> Connor. Uh, so that kind of makes sense, right? So you, you take the, um, the experience oh, oh, okay. you provide, or take the current experience that is being provided, break it down into different segments and say, you know, if I could just do this one piece a little bit better you know, there's some value there. Or, and then maybe I could do the other pieces better, but then you just you just pick one, pick your niche, really find something that's different that you want to provide to people, make a better experience, and then see if it'll sell. Yeah. Sounds sounds right. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> hey, um, right people, people who are watching, but also there is, a, uh, there is a thing, aside from the chat, there's an ask a question area. 
So uh, if, if you don't, yes, there's we are through that to talk forever. So we'll talk about whatever we talk about. But if you have something specific, feel free to, to shoot us uh, a question. Yeah, we're here for you. That's so right. Take over, send us some questions. That's right. Uh, or we'll just ramble on and on. We could easily do that. Yeah, I've kind of, I've demonstrated that too much already. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all can do that. <laughs> So, uh, so while we're waiting for questions, I, I like the concept of leadership, though. I like Gary's thinking about leadership because I think this. I've been doing some other talks about, um, you know, how do you set up remote working in a leadership capacity strategically, and then how do you think about it for yourself as the leader? Because now you may have a couple of stakeholders if you're a kind of a lean startup. You may have, you know, you're trying to get investors, you're trying to get customers, you might try and get, you know, other people to come along with you, workers, advisors. So, you know, you, you have to think about your leadership ability during this time as well, because during great times, you know, everybody wants to kind of buy into you and your idea and what you, you want to do and you want people to do that. And that's important. But I think during kind of harder times, like now, it's it's even requires more of you to do that, especially now that we're social distance as well. So that yeah. you know, it, you really have to like step up on the leadership level. Yeah, and I mean, it goes back to what we we're talking about earlier. Again, like you know, we're all being traumatized right now, so people are in this totally different right now, right now. Right now, right now, you, I like. I'm okay. Stop though. looking I'm at me, Elon. Stop looking at me. I don't like people with glasses. They freak me out. Oh, Connor. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't have my glasses, too. You didn't get that memo, Gary? <laughs> uh, all right. But yeah, but I mean, like, look, everyone's in a very, very fragile mindset right now. And yeah, people yeah. are behaving and acting in ways that they don't usually act. And it, for a lot of people, it's hard for them to catch themselves because they've never really kind of been through this sort of like, you know, experience before. And so everyone's reacting very very different ways. They got smaller, like, you know, fuse boxes. They're more depressed. They're more like disconnected emotionally, uninvested, unmotivated. Like it's hard, like, you know, like people are dying that they know, right. Or suffering and sick and people are scared. And it's really, really difficult to find the energy to work on something that in a lot of ways doesn't have much meaning to the world. Right. And I, I'm not gonna like say everything's like that, but most things that we're building, like a delivery app, like, yeah, it serves a purpose right now. It could be helpful, but in the big picture, in terms of what life is, like, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool, it's fun, but it's not like, you know, changing the world. And that's like one of the like, kind of like weird startup culture things is that everyone thinks they need to be changing the world and thinks that they are like, I went to this pitch competition thing and this person got up in front of everyone and they're like, we're going to change the world. And they go forward to present what they are doing. And it's a bookmark application. They're making it easier for people to save bookmarks on their, on their browser. And I'm like, Doesn't wow, saving the world. Good job. Right. And then you like, I have in my bookmarks. Doesn't that already exist? <laughs> what about yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But I mean, like, it's just like, myself. I think I think a lot of people though are realizing that a lot of what they're doing with their life, it's not the most fulfilling thing. It's not actually changing the world. And it's very, very hard to stay focused on working on it in the midst of all this. So absolutely, like, you know, as leaders, like we, we need to think about what culture that we really want to represent, what we're trying to do to benefit not just like our workforce and the people that we serve, but ourselves too. Like is this really like something that is fulfilling? And if it's not, what can we do to iterate and adapt to make it more meaningful, right? And I think that's like a, a starting point. And then leadership's like, you know, it's always from me, the leader, down. I've been setting the example for everyone else to follow. If I'm doing something that is really wild and inappropriate, everyone else that is kind of on the fence right and if they lean more towards like the inappropriate side they're going to see it as like oh that's carte blanche i can do whatever i want oh heck yeah this is what i've been waiting for a workplace where i can just rock around naked on camera right or if they're on the other side right then they're like whoa 
I this is completely messed up. I'm out of here, right? So you gotta like just be aware of who you are as a leader and the example that you're setting. I'm using really extreme examples there, but any little bit of like toxicity, it spreads a million times faster than any bit of kind of like righteousness and goodwill. So yeah, Alon, what do you got? I, I think, well, uh, you're absolutely right. So I'll say like something that um, I remember I was on a call like one of the first weeks of lockdown, they did like a, a big call for the whole Draper Venture Network, um, which is a, a group that we're a part of. And it's like 50 funds around the world and their fund managers all got on a call together. That's like this private kind of like, hey, we're gonna talk about this crisis and, and see. And uh, while we were on that, a lot of people were talking about like their startups are gonna have to start doing layoffs. And these are international, so, in most of the rest of the world, they were hit by it before us, um, or at least they all went into lockdown before us or around, you know, whatever was going on, it, it, it hit a lot of these people first. And they were talking about firing people. They are talking about our, what is the, the government in their jurisdiction, their area doing to help companies? Like, and, you know, somebody, one person's like, yeah, one of our companies that called us said they laid off like half their employees. And then all these things and and i started thinking about it because until that moment i didn't really think about like i worried about some of our companies who were fundraising and like oh shit, it's going to be much harder for them but i thought about that sort of like be the cockroach oh come on like at the very beginning i was like yeah they'll 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 you know tough it out for a couple months and they'll be back to normal but other people were you know realizing this was a lot and i was in that moment and it, it freaked me out for like a split second but also instantly saw within our portfolio companies coming off that call, I actually had an email from one of our companies already, it must have been there before the call, but I didn't see it yet, where they're like, hey, here's, a, they actually had like four slides and they sent this to all of their investors and all of their employees and everyone within their thing. And they're a small startup, not a lot of employees, but they were like a quarter of the way through a fundraise. So it's gonna be a tough time. Right. And in the thing, it was like, here's some slides of what we're doing differently now. And uh, and um, they literally said, um, they said, hey, we don't know yet if we're gonna have to do this for employees. We don't know what we're gonna have to do, if we're gonna have to, like they were in the process of hiring. So like we're pausing hiring. Um, one of the only things they actually changed other than just tell people that they're thinking about things is that they had already, the only thing that, that was an actual like concrete change was in the in the first you know bullet point was um the founders of the company are taking a 30 percent pay cut so that we can extend our runway they didn't take down their employees pay yet they, yeah. they were honest that they don't know what's going on but they're going to freeze hiring people so we're all going to have to work our butts off and step it up a notch and like but the first thing was they sacrificed for themselves and nobody else because they straight up said, you know, we own this company. It's we're going to make sure it keep it alive. Yeah. And that was like a really great example of like leadership, right? Versus, you know, what came up the couple days after with, uh, you know, like people firing people over Zoom and shit like that. Not like, not, not that we have no choice in that matter, but like yeah. hiring 300 people at once on like a mass call, you know? Yeah. Like, and I, like yeah, a very similar call as well. Uh, we had a very yeah. Call where we sat down with the portfolio companies that we have and said, you know, hey, how are you guys doing? How are you feeling? You know, a lot of them are small. You know, how, how do you guys want to proceed as far as fundraising? How do we go about now talking about, you know, incorporating this into your strategy? You know, and then, you know, just that what Gary keeps saying, that mental, you know, are you because this was I think it was about a week after everyone got locked down um as well and we said hey how is everyone doing you know we gave them some resources we said here's some resources for you guys here's some things that we're going to try and do for you guys so i mean i think you know that gives them comfort as well that they have our support you know from a fundraising startup side as well yeah, yeah they they want to know you're you're in it right like absolutely you, we told all of our portfolio companies like you know we're we are looking for other companies and looking, continuing to grow. And we don't want to let this stop us or slow us down. We want to look at this as shitty as the whole situation is, as, as much of an opportunity as we can without, you know, it being, you know, uh, predatory or weird or, or um, unfair or, or just in bad taste or whatever. But like, 
we told them, you guys are our first priority. Like we're, we're a family, we're a team. We look at it this way. So we went to all of our companies. We're figuring out what they need and what, um, what is, you know, going on with them. We're going to make sure that they all stay alive and live another day so we can all get out of this and, uh, and support each other and continue to grow. Um, there's like, there's yeah. two things that you touched on. It's really important. Like as, as leaders, you need to be transparent and honest with your, your, your workers, your employees, like you need to keep them in the loop so they can make informed decisions about their life. Like, especially in a situation like this, like mm -hmm. it's, it's unfair to keep them in the dark of what's going on. And like, of course there's like certain boundaries, but also, like, also with, with your investors. Yeah. You have to yeah. be the same Extremely positive. You have to be extremely positive and motivational to, to your team and your employees. Like, you know, saying, like I mentioned that before, like, I mean, that we're taking a pay cut is, is one thing that's like, oh, wow, they're doing it. That could be a signal that like shit's about to go down. I should be looking for another job. Or it could be a signal that these are ex excellent leaders. And if you say, you know, oh man, things are really bad, blah, 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 like only focus on negative and hey, we're, we're paying ourselves less. So like, you know, whatever that could look really bad or you can say look this is we're going to make it through this to ensure we're going to make it through this we took our own pay cut for ourselves and we're going to do xyz and yeah we're all going to have to work our butts off and make it through this but everyone's going to have to do that it's a weird time it's a tough time but we got this right like you can come out of it as a positive or you can go through it and we're all going to die it's all horrible and <laughs> bad and like hey what's the point of all of it right like yeah you, you, you know and it's tough to be that person but like the same gary the stuff that gary was touching on and in, in how hard it is and and all of the horrible you know it's depressing as hell to be stuck at home all day long like looking outside it's a beautiful day but i didn't leave the house like i sat on the patio for about seven minutes uh with my kids and i got now it's a sunday we should have been out outside all day goofing around having fun but but anyway it sucks but you can, you know, uh, what Gary was saying, all these things that are really hard right now, if you can make it through it, you are an exceptional startup founder and right. you have the right sort of intestinal fortitude or right whatever everything. it takes yeah. to make it through this stuff. Yes, so you, have, this, you have it all. Yeah. But I mean, like you, you gotta be careful though. Like you can't, you can't be all fluff and you can't be bullshitting people. Like yeah. if you, if you know the situation's dire, Right, you need to be yeah. honest and gi give them at least uh, the opportunity to make a choice, like you know what they want to do, or you know in this situation, a lot of times, like you know, some like you know some really, really smart business owners are firing their employees so they can get on unemployment, and they are essentially like you know, look, this is the situation. Like we're too small of a company to do this. We aren't getting access to PP PPP loans. The best thing right now for you in your life is for me to fire you so you can go on unemployment. Once we get things going again, we're back to, you know, kind of business as usual as as, as usual as we can get, right? After this, you still have a position at my company. Once I'm able to hire you, I want you back. But for the time being, I think this is the wisest thing that you can do for your own well-being, right? And so like it's totally okay to be like that if that's the reality of the situation that your business is in and how you want to interact with your, your employees. The other thing that was really important that, you know, that, that uh, founding team did was that they put the onus on themselves to make the sacrifices. As a, as a business owner, you should never put that on your employees. Your employees are employees. Like no one's, no one's got the skin in the game. No one's got the passion, the concern, the care for your well, company like you do. If, if you're so, a good, if you're a good leader, you've created skin in the game for them. You've given them some equity. You make people feel like they're a part of the family, and that's a part of making them feel like they're a part of the family. Like if you're, if you're a dad, you take care of your, you know, kids before you take care of yourself. If you're a, a big yeah. brother, you take care of your, your little sister before you take care of yourself. Like you should look at that as the founder of the company the same way. Like yeah. And but the problem is that like when business founders use that as a, a, um, a tool of manipulation, right? Like there's too many founders that are out there where they are giving like, you know, equity to employees and they're not paying them a competitive wage. And they're expecting that employee to have that diehard loyalty for the company just because they got a little bit of equity. And you're like, why? They're not able to pay their bills with that equity. You're not paying their bills. Why would they have that loyalty? And all you're doing is essentially guilting them to feeling like they are on your same level as being an owner in the company because they have a little bit of equity. 
but it's just a completely, oh, completely yeah, it's just a manipulative tactic. Yeah. So you gotta oh, be like, you know, it's just you need to be aware if you're utilizing these sorts of like, you know, like equity and compensation and such, where the line is and what to expect of your employees and what not to. Because at the end of the day, everyone's just trying to survive and take care of their family and themselves, right? So respect that if you don't want to like, you know, go off the deep end and scare people away and ruin like your whole reputation. Yeah. One, there one was a there was a good lean lean question in here about what percentage of startup resources should be devoted to marketing. Yep. That's a good question. Wow. Um, I I, I'll, I'll go because I had this thought earlier. I had a thought earlier. I have a lot of thoughts on that one. Okay, so Barbara can give something more definitive, but my my feelings in the early stage are uh, are that um, one a lot. Uh, I mean, it, de it depends. I won't go on, on that. I, I was going to mention earlier when we were talking about sales and validating and all this stuff, um, no excuses. Like I will call bullshit on anyone that says we don't know what our customer is until we raise a million dollars and I can spend a hundred thousand dollars on marketing or, or yeah. $50,000 and spend it like figuring out your first customers. And sometimes, the, the best customers and sometimes moving forward, all of your customers can be done for almost nothing, if not free. And by almost nothing, I still mean a shit ton of your time and a lot of your hard, hard, hard work to get it done. But like it, you as the founder should know how to do that and then figure out a way to scale it. But like I've done sales for our conferences. I did sales for our, my previous company with, with SaaS tools that cost me little to no money, and I'll say less than $100 a month, uh, automation and working your butt off, right? And and your only barrier to entry on all of these things is is time and Google. Like, you can figure this out. Like, if you go, sit, like, Google sales automation and start figuring stuff out, and you figure out, like, oh, here's this tool that helps me get people's email addresses from LinkedIn searches, and you take that tool, and you go, okay, I do the best, like who's my main customer? I go on LinkedIn, I search for that customer, now I have 100 results. Now I find, get the emails for half of those people, or maybe not, maybe I don't use that tool, maybe I just go to their websites one by one, and I figure out what their email addresses is. Because I guarantee you, there's not, if you list 10 people right now on a piece of paper, including Steve Wozniak and, uh, and freaking Jack Dorsey, right? You list 10 people, if you can't find seven of their email addresses in 24 hours, you didn't try. You just didn't try. I don't believe you. Find them. Like Jack's on Twitter, so like well, yeah, exactly. yeah. But I'm saying like more on Twitter versus like in an email. So, so but that, that's that's my my feelings, right? Like so, if you can't figure out their email addresses, you're not trying. Then take those people, send them a message, pick up the phone, do whatever you can to close close a sale and figure it out. And once once you can figure that out, then you can scale it up. Then you can maybe hire some growth hacker, some person who's a, the head of sales or whatever. But you can't, if you say that the reason why I'm not scaling or haven't figured this out yet is because I need to raise the money to hire the person or to spend the money on the Google ads or the Facebook ads or whatever, then you haven't tried yet. Like you, you haven't done your job. So I've said that because it was pertaining to something we said earlier and we're going full, like I'm thinking full lean, coronavirus, I'm unable to raise any money at this exact moment kind of feeling. And um, call me on my shit, give me an example, and I'll tell you uh, things that I've done in the past the same way. And I've had a startup where I wasn't able to raise money. We went out of business and I've had we raised to work the same way. Sorry, Barbara, go. No, keep it on the cheap. But you know, when you look at these fundraising decks and you got 50 or 60 or 70 percent done to marketing, you really have to ask yourself a question. Why is that? Like I ask that all the time. Why is that? Because at the point in time when you need money, that should be when, you know, after you've done all your funny, you know, back end, hand done, rigged up technology piece where you actually really should be kind of starting to build some real technology versus not because you're marketing. Like Alon said, you've already done the bootstrap marketing. You have your one person web page and some Zapier, hopefully connecting and, you know, duct taping all that together and string and glue. And then, you know, maybe you have a little Firebase or something on the back. I don't know. You got a little bit of something, some APIs going back and forth. 
But at some point in time, you have to build something for real. Like Airbnb eventually built something. Amazon eventually built yeah, something. You know what? Like, I, you know, the fact that you want to have 70% marketing and you still have the taped up duct tape thing is a problem. Yeah. Well, I think that there's, it depends on the stage is the real answer, right? Because yeah. once your later stage, you have, stage, absolutely. It should all kind of go to marketing. If, if you can show me that $1 in marketing equals a buck 50 in, uh, in recurring revenue, but you need to raise the money because you need to float it and you need, you need to throw gasoline on the fire and you're even going to optimize it and make it better over time. Spend 97% of your money on marketing. That's awesome. You know, it's like, it, it's, uh, but that's out of that 50 cents, then some, some portion of the 50 cents has to go back into your business. You know, like you have to recycle that back into your company. And then, then you have to ask, so what is, what is that now going to do? Cause you can only have the marketed duct tape thing for so long. Yeah. And that's where people go wrong when they like, aren't taking enough time to establish what their, their financial model is. Right. They don't understand where money's going and where they're making money, you know, most efficiently or where they're losing the most money, like, like hand over, like, you know, foot, like, or whatever that phrase is. You know what I mean? Hand over, yeah, that, that, that one, that one. But yeah, anyhow, you know, there's just a leaky sieve because they're unaware of it, right? And so you gotta take the time before you go, you know, really dumping money into things to make sure that you know where that money's going and what's taking, like, you know, what's bringing return. It's like, it's, it's another one of these things in startup culture where people, really frown on any sort of documentation and operational like you know uh systems they think that it's too corporate and it's like you can be lean you can build a very agile lean startup with some documentation the necessary documentation you need to have some documentation and it goes back to again like you know treating everything as a science experiment how can you learn if you're not documenting what's going on how do you know how to analyze the results how do you how do you learn from any of that if you can't track it? So yeah, yeah. And I, I do agree with Alon. If if it's getting a return, you know, like hey, you did ran these Facebook ads, you put in a dollar, you get two dollars back, three dollars back, then you know that's working. Well, but the thing but, is, you, you, get... may, you know, other things you may not know, but the the reality is, you do need to write it all down. I spent so much on Facebook ads, I got this many people, and I got this much return. Like you got to write it down. Yeah, that's the that's where they have to be able to answer the question to the uh, to the uh, to the investor, right? Like, not to like how much like, percentage they have to justify the percentage because if you can ju you can justify anything because there's lots of companies where they'll say, okay, the average customer lasts me four months, and mm -hmm. so my lifetime value is forty dollars because ten bucks a month. Right. So if I can get a new customer for less than forty dollars, I win, right? But maybe you'll we'll find out that when you spend a million dollars on marketing a month, your average customer lasts you three months, and now you lost ten dollars a customer. But so whatever that the 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 math is, you're just gonna have to justify it and and push the limits and don't be afraid. Like what drives me nuts is when I talk to customers and they're like, I spend a thousand dollars a month on Facebook ads and we're killing it. We're like, how come you after week one where it was doing really good, you didn't bump it to to two thousand dollars, and then at week two, when it continued to rise, would make it three thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars. What you know, especially once you have money in the bank, of course. Don't be stupid. Uh, uh, that, yeah, but that's that, all the that, questions. That, like, if, you're, if you're making two dollars off of that one dollar, then you can bump the two dollars. Maybe it's one fifty. So, uh, like, of course, but you might not be able to because the two dollars might be over three months, and uh, uh, you have to. Yeah, you, know, you can't credit card everything. But that's yeah. also that's this also comes down to writing this down and figuring it out. But that's yeah. also a lesson. Uh, I I used to think if people were crazy when they're like, make sure you get an Amex card, and I'm like, I don't put anything on credit cards. I'm like opposite. I hate debt. I'm like uh, uh, I I hate that stuff. But you know, giving yourselves an extra thirty days of float is a really really good idea when you get customers that you know you now can get two months worth of of revenue to pay back last month's ads. So think, uh, you know, be careful, but, but it's a, it's a good tool. It can save you a lot over time. Yeah. So it like, again, like the, the main thing is context is key for, you know, what percentage and all that stuff you should put into it. It's, it totally depends on the context of your business, 
your situation, what's going on, what stage you're at, right? All these different things. And you're going to be able to understand what percentage is, is doable by having a proper financial model in place that is reflective of everything that's going on. So you can really make informed decisions about that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess a question for all the panelists is, do you see there a shift in capital or talent towards more medical or biotech ventures to combat COVID right now? So personally, in my, in my realm of life, everybody, I, I, have, I, I haven't seen a reposition to that yet. I think people that have things in the pipeline have their relationship. A lot of investors have just stopped because like what Alon said, they all went and had a meeting and said, okay, we need to kind of deal with our portfolios and our current portfolios. And we're putting on hold some of these other things. Now, as far as like the medical side of life, I mean, it makes logical sense from an investment side, but are you really going to get your return? The, the reason why medical normally takes so long is because it's a 25 year journey. And so, you know, maybe if it's a PPE company, it makes sense. I mean, we have an alcohol company, so we are repositioning that to do alcohol and hand sanitizer. They'll we'll forever need that. But that's a sustainability play as well, because we were just going to toss that other part of the plan out of, for the alcohol. So you might as well just make the hand sanitizer. So you have yeah. to think about like, which parts of that do you want to play in? Because even if it took two years for a vaccine or some type of other, you know, something else to happen, pharmaceutical stuff, it's still, you know, like a, a long poll. And it's still like a bet because FDA, are they approving everybody still? I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's very lax right now. And they don't need a full submission. There's a very, it's called the, yeah, I know they have the fast FDA because one of my other companies, we, my very first companies did that. But like, is everybody on fast track FDA? And then you still have to pick like who's going to win. Like, yeah, they might have five vaccines, but they'll still be the guy that's the first vaccine. And they'll be the second vaccine or they'll be the first therapeutic. And then they will be the second therapy. You know what I'm saying? It yeah. still like, becomes a, a game of picking. Yeah, I think I think that um to get get back to the question, um, I have seen some people like run after some uh, particular deals in the space that's going on, but it's generally people who are already focused on medical stuff. Mm -hmm. I think um, I don't know. I think just like startups, you're you're you got to be focused. And so if you're yeah. a fund that doesn't focuses on medical stuff and you're trying to jump on an opportunity, you're probably going to end up losing your shirt. Like it's right. just like, just, just like startups. And something you have to remember when, when there's, when you're looking at funds, uh, it took me a long time to realize this. And then I realized, you know, as I went from more entrepreneur to more investor, I learned that investors, feel your pain more than you ever realize they're always in fundraising mode themselves you know every every basically three years or so they have to try to raise a new fund or else they don't have a company anymore um and so uh and so you know there's a it's a to different type of person they're going after to raise money and stuff like that but essentially they're 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 in your boat. So when they give you feedback on your deck or your pitch or something, they, they also pitch all the time. Um, but right now there's sort of three, there's funds in three positions, right? There's funds who uh, were about to fundraise or right in the process of fundraising and it's not gonna happen or at least it's gonna be delayed. And so they're not investing. There's funds that um, are, uh, just closed their fundraising rounds and they are sort of you know at the best possible opportunity they could be in um as a fund because they will get sort of pick of the litter while there's less active uh funds and things like that and then there's funds who are somewhere in the middle or towards the end of the rope where they have to hunker down and focus on their portfolio mm -hmm. and so when i was on that call with all the funds the, there, there were sort of two things, and I saw a question earlier, I'll get to it, that everyone was was sort of like in, in agreement with. Like, we're not going to mess with companies that we've already made agreements with and things like that. We're not going to, you know, panic and be the people that, that take things back or try to renegotiate a deal to get better terms because those people are asses 
and those people will have that reputation for the rest of their lives and you will never want to work with them. And this moment in time is a moment in time. And if you decide to take advantage of it and take advantage of people in that moment of time, people are going to remember it better than anything they ever remembered in their life. Like, remember that asshole who pulled the rug out from under us? We're never going to work with them again. We're going to make sure everyone knows about it. So, right. so don't be that person. Um, and then, you know, sort of the next thing that everyone, uh, um, you know, agreed with was we're going to work our butts off to try to keep things as much business as usual as possible because investing in companies and growing uh, companies at this time is more important than ever, right? Like Gary and I always discuss that early stage startups and small businesses are in this new world, the only sectors of the economy who are creating net new jobs. They're the only groups creating jobs. So if we can be super full of ourselves and be like, we're changing the world because we're giving people money, but like the, the, the entrepreneurs are the people that are changing the world, but the investors can throw gasoline on that fire. And to go from, hey, the four founders or the four people to 40 employees will require money. And in this day and age, we need people who are creating jobs as m much as possible. Absolutely. Right? Like, this, and we, we all need to get back to work and we all need to make sure that we take care of each other and can feed our families and, you know, do everything we possibly can. And it's scary as hell. So, so like that's at least in our jobs and our role, that's what we have to do. We got to get to it. Um, and so, and not to let fear slow us down because you could go, Hey, uh, we're a yeah, fun not speaking about us specifically, but you know, just in general, fund has $5 million in the bank. We could hold that as much as possible and trickle it out slower so that we can ensure we have, you know, a job for the long term. Um, or we can continue to rock and roll, blow this out of the water. Hopefully our investments reap rewards and we can continue to grow, uh, and do more good right now. You know, and oh, so people can't, can't be yeah, sort of at it as well, Lon. Yeah. You look at it the exact same way. Yeah, I Talk mean, like same way. Talking from like the entrepreneurial side of things, like I'm seeing lots of people, like you know, in like you know the different groups that you know kind of like manage. There are a lot of people that are trying too hard to turn this into an opportunity, and it, it becomes more of that predatory kind of like I'm going to create a business and I'm just going to like you know go around and like. You know, even like the most like basic, super extreme example, just to use extremes again, the, the, the person that sees themselves as an entrepreneur that's going around to all the different like, you know, uh, stores and buying up all the hand sanitizer. And they're like, oh yeah, now I got all the hand sanitizer. So I'm starting a hand sanitizer as a reselling business, right? And you're like, the hell are you doing? Like, that's not, that's not being entrepreneurial, that's being a, an asshole. <laughs> like, come on. And so like, there's lots of like other lesser examples of that, of people kind of rushing to try to turn this into an opportunity for them to finally start their business or not their business, but any business. But that's the problem. Like when you're trying too hard and you're trying to force it, you're going to totally miss the mark. Like you're, you're, you don't understand again, what experience I should be creating, what the benefits of that is and who that is best serving. Right. And that's well, what like, you know, two, two quick things. And, and yeah. Gary will have something to say on this uh, and we'll keep it going. Bad entrepreneurs and bad investors uh, follow trends versus yeah. lead trends. So something happened. We need to do something about it. You're already yeah. too late, right? Yeah. So, so forget about the predatory part, right? Like uh, even though like those people are, are, are idiots and they're stupid and they're out there. Yeah. Opportunity. It's it's just gonna be bad. But if your reason for doing something is because something else happened. You, you're not that passionate entrepreneur who has this idea that's long term. Like some yeah. people were were there in this horrible time and that their businesses just were able to, to kind of help it and be a part of it. And that's an opportunity for that particular company, however you look at it, whatever. But if you're going like, oh, I think I've got a hookup for somebody who can make masks and I'm going to now, yeah. you know, if you're a clothing company that already makes stuff and it's like, yes, you should make masks because it seems like at least for the near future, you're going to sell some masks and keep your employees in business and help yeah, them and masks. And masks, it's important. But mm -hmm. if you like think you're going to all of a sudden take advantage or like, you know, get some government contract and do some weird shady stuff, then you're, you're an ass. Um, but but I think that that's, you have to look at this like, let's go, okay, there's this thing happened. What's on the horizon 10 years from now? What's something that I'm super passionate about that I can attack and, and 
do as an entrepreneur, okay. But like, you have to be thinking way more ahead than what's happening over the next six months, or else you're yeah. not creating a yeah. real yeah. Yeah. At least startup that's you know uh, investable. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I mean, like, we, we talk about this a lot too. I mean, like, when when you're coming up with an idea for a product, a service, a business, it can happen in two two different ways. One is kind of like what we just discussed, like, you know, people are looking at what possible opportunities are in front of them and trying to seize on one of them. Or, you know, they might even take a more kind of like academic approach where they'll look at different market trends, industry trends, and they'll try to analyze that and, and determine what an opportunity might be that's coming up based on those trends. And that's totally viable in, in some cases to do that. The other way to come up with a great business idea product service is through your own personal experiences. Just be more aware of the experiences that you're having in your life and the experiences those around you, like directly around you are having too. And then take the next step and ask why. Why is that a good experience? Why is that a bad experience? Why did I react that way? Why did I really enjoy that? Why did I hate that? What, what caused that emotional response in me while I was experiencing this, right? And as you start to analyze more and more about your experiences and you practice more, uh, um, you know, kind of like uh, you dig, dig deeper into like, you know, the reasoning behind why you're having those experiences or you practice more empathy towards the people that you're witnessing having experiences around you, all of a sudden you'll start to identify immense numbers of opportunities to create new products, new services and new businesses around that. And it's coming from a place that's much more passionate and long lasting than I just think that's a good idea and I want to make some money too, right? Like it's something that's that's more those are the best, those are the best startups. Yeah, it's like it come out of like your personalized something happened, you know, like your personalized experience, whatever it is, positive or negative. Mo uh, the most successful on don't feel like it's a choice. Right? Like you don't go like yeah. I'm gonna start this business purely for these economic reasons. Like I put together an Excel spreadsheet and man, I'm gonna start the company. Some people do that. Yeah, no, some people do that and they're, they can be very successful, but most sort of startup entrepreneurs who go from nothing to building something and figure it out and, uh, and make it happen are usually because they're so passionate about something, they, they're, they get become obsessive with it, right? You yeah. feel like, hey, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And, and, and it started from a, a spreadsheet, it could have started from anywhere, it doesn't matter where it starts from, but that's, that's that feeling you have, so. Yeah, um, and, and I, I want to say that part of part of the, the success of those startups that start from like a personal experience or one closely related to them isn't only the passion, but it's also the deeper understanding of what the hell is going on. All the nuances and intricacies that surround that idea, that market, that, you know, that industry, that solution, that thing that they want to build they come from that whole world. So they understand how to approach it much better than someone that just goes through a bunch of data and is like, oh, hey, yeah, this is a great opportunity, I believe. I'm going to go for that. Because all of a sudden, they're transplanting themselves into this whole other alien world that they don't understand. And they're making a lot of assumptions and almost all assumptions versus someone that's coming from personal experience where a lot of it isn't assumptions because they've been living this the last like you know five years, 10, 20, whatever, right? And so there's that whole extra layer of opportunity to seize the moment there. Mm -hmm. You getting beamed up over there? I'm kind of getting excited, wow. <laughs> so the after party starting, starting to throw <laughs> the trance music. <laughs> But yeah, like the that makes sense. The those who are already in the space that can pivot and help what's what they can, what they already have infrastructure in place. You know, we're seeing a lot of that right now. Mm -hmm. Like distillery is changing. Like yeah, you're saying Barbara. yeah. I mean, the alcohol. Like we had another company. They they're in the travel space, but they do rental clothing. So we said, look, you know, they still have a good customer base, but, you know, clothing comes back. And we said, well, look, could you reposition that clothing into something, mass, PPE, something? They said, well, we won't do it, but we'll donate to somebody that does. It. I said, well, that's a good idea. Yeah. So, like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's not their core business, the manufacturing, but they said, okay, we're going to take these things and put them, you know, put them to a good use. So that's another repurpose. So it, it yeah. all depends. It, you know, it all depends. 
I, I, I can give an example, right? Like we do conferences and that's where we get all of our deal flow and everything that we do. And I had to coach up this one other conference because they had this, uh, they wanted to put together a conference that um, uh, we're gonna, uh, I was gonna speak at and so was Joseph, my, my partner on the fund. And like they decided at one point they were gonna make the tickets for the conference cost some money. And it was gonna be a fraction of what the, the amount of money that, that they do. Um, that they normally charge is, but they're like, hey, at least we'll get a little bit of money through the door, like a, a few hundred dollars. And I told them, I was like, that it's it's so short sighted and and ridiculous because one, the hundred couple hundred dollars is not going to change your life. Like, if it was going to change your life, like, th let's figure this out and let's come up with some other ideas and do something. But is the couple hundred dollars going to change your life? And it's not going to for this particular person. And so. And then I asked him, I said, do you think a lot less people are going to sign up to your event because you're charging some money? And he's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. We'll probably have like, you know, 100 people come instead of if it was free, we'd probably get a few thousand people to come. And I was like, well, if you had a few thousand people's email addresses and phone numbers and details, do you think when we get out of this and you can do something with that, you'll make a lot more than the couple hundred dollars today? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, why the hell aren't you doing that? And that's exactly what we're doing with, with our conferences and stuff. We, we have no illusions that we're going to sell tickets to digital events when there's great digital events like you guys are doing here today. There's awesome events every single day now online and great content. And so yeah. we, we realize like there's no, it's, it's silly to charge. Like maybe there's special, there's certain reasons why you might charge for an online event. I'm not saying no online events should, should cost money, but for these particular sort of big events, like, like we do, get thousands of people to come, get their contact info, start to get to know them. And guess what? It'll turn into customers for our portfolio company. It'll turn into customers for us later. It'll, it'll be something else. And so you have to kind of think like, oh, maybe doing something right now that's a free promotion, you know, like right. um, somebody who does, uh, who does, you know, um, cool, uh, cool shirts or, or, things like that might have really cool artwork. Maybe they should just make some free, funny Zoom backgrounds for people, right? Give them away for anyone who comes to their site and signs up on their newsletter. Um, you know, like anything like that. Use it as an advantage to do something that that you're at home. You might, if in a situation like Barbara just talked about, your whole, your whole industry might be completely gone right now and might go to, to right. zero. Um, what can you do right now to, to build up that marketing list, to, to do stuff that you've got all the time in the world, not all the time in the world, because we all have, you know, if you're, uh, if you're yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. You might have kids at home doing school and craziness and a whole different lifestyle, but you have the time you are spending working, think about that, right? Like we're, we're supposed to be talking about lean, lean startup stuff right now. Like what that can is a part you do? Of a lean startup. Yeah. If you think about it, that is a part of, of lean startup. Yeah. Look, I, I got on my computer right now. I turned off an automated LinkedIn messenger that I have that was sending a message that was just t took over my my computer for the day while I'm hanging out with the family and whatever. I turned that off to turn on this thing. And when I sign off from this, I'm going to turn that back on and it's going to send emails one by one to people who are classified under a certain category on my LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, you just send me that. <laughs> It, it, I need that as well. LinkedIn helper. It is the LinkedIn best. Helper, oh, I'm gonna go get that. It's the best it. worst tool you will ever have in your awesome. life. It is Love it. A terrible experience. It is like the worst product from like a if you were like this way, but it it does cool things. Is is and uh, LinkedIn is good uh, at keeping you from being spammy, but it's really good for if you have a connection. Like let's say we want to do an event in person in Thousand Oaks tomorrow, right? And, uh, or in Santa Barbara tomorrow. And we, uh, we go to our LinkedIn, we figure out who's in the Santa Barbara area and we shoot them all messages. Um, and it's not everyone. You can't just go like mass message a thousand people at once. It literally like one minute at a time. Oh, at a time. Right? Oh, that's cool. so, so, you know, and LinkedIn will get you in trouble if you don't follow the rules. So don't, don't get aggressive and, and uh, yeah, that, yeah, it's always and, the worst thing you do. And, and I always actually, my, um, my messages usually start with, Hey, just an automated message to let you know, so that people don't think I'm like singling them out or obligating them or being weird like that. Also, like, I, I like, that's my whole tactic is to, to be very obligated, 
hey, I'm feeling <laughs> out. I want you to be a speaker on our next event. Well, a speaker you gotta, thing. <laughs> you got to yeah, do this. <laughs> automated messages to a thousand people to be speakers is kind of weird. Um, but, but yeah, but the, you know the numbers game, like, man. First, that was first going first on. As far as like the connection building, like the yeah. fact that this is also an opportunity and a time to be really, you know, like who's really around, who are we really doing business with? Who do we really want to do business with? You know, how are we going to move these, you know, these businesses and relationships forward? Like this is a time to really start thinking about that as well. Absolutely. So it's super important from, from, you know, your lean startup side, you know, who do you really want to connect with? Who do you really want to participate with? You know, these, these are the things you need to even think, you know, you might want an advisory board. Who do you want as a potential advisor? But, you know, like you may want to participate and speak at something. Like, how do you reach out to those type of people? Because you, that can get you kind of, you know, like now you can kind of get free exposure. They, you know, we're doing all these speaking things online. Somebody said, hey, are you slowed down with the speaking thing? I said, absolutely. I mean, I've got more speaking things now than I've ever had in the physical realm. So easy, it's so easy now. You know, you're not driving around, flying around to. I don't have to fly them. anywhere. I don't have to drive anywhere. I Push just the button. To hey. So that's kind of cool. But like, you know, if you think about that logically, it's like most people think like, oh, this is so glamorous and wonderful. But it's also about building those new relationships and building like new relationships and creating, you know, your keeping your current relationships like even stronger. And that's it. Yeah. I've yeah, definitely yeah. continued to meet people. Like we do the every yeah. Tuesday night blockchain and booze. I love that blockchain and booze. It's so good. And uh, uh, Cameron and and some of the crew from here. That was has so great last week. Last week with the educational yeah, one. That was great. That it was it was so much fun. But I'm I know that for sure there are multiple real connections I've made mm -hmm. for, okay. since doing that from people that I didn't know before we did that. So this this shouldn't be an excuse, just like it shouldn't be an excuse that you have no budget for marketing. Uh, you you should know uh, how to market your product with zero budget before you have a budget. And if you don't, then you don't yeah. know the, the business you're in. For the same uh, same reason, you know that that now is not an excuse to not meet new people. It, it definitely gets in the way. It makes it harder. It makes it a pain in the butt. Like you can't go and have a meeting at somebody's office. But it there's there's opportunities. The, the other thing too, I mean, like when we're talking about being lean, your network, the relationships you have is the most valuable resource you can accumulate. And it's the easiest one too. doesn't cost money. doesn't need to cost money. But when you forge those authentic relationships with people, you have a resource that's willing to help you and support you and make introductions or do you know favors for you or give you connections to things that you didn't have. And all of a sudden, you're seeing your 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 necessary budget to make something happen get way smaller because now you got all these people throwing in favors for you and they're doing a lot of the work for you. And I'm not saying take advantage right. of people. I'm saying build authentic relationships, real ones. As well, if they're you, like you they're friends, right? Yeah. Right. Important. This is a time to be doing it. Yeah. And so like you know, if you want to get lean build a strong relationship network and things will get way lean just naturally. You just need yeah. to be a type of mindset. Again, mindset. You're not afraid to ask for support from people that you know, if you care about them and they care about you, there's no shame in that. The whole point of having a support network is to get support, right? Just be extremely humble and extremely patient because if you're asking people to do favors for you, they're not, you're not entitled to any of that. So don't ever act entitled. That's like the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Is uh, a way to create a relationship. Yeah. But, but act, uh, but be confident. Don't be weird about hiding your idea and things like that. Because right. if, uh, if, if you're being that way too, uh, then you are probably not confident in your ability to execute better than the person that you're talking to. And then you probably shouldn't be doing that company. Uh, so, don't, don't be too secretive. Uh, let people know because on the same reason why you should let your employees and your investors know what's going on, uh, you'll be surprised how much more you get by being transparent and honest than you get from being secretive. Um, it's so. that authenticity, you know, like be, be just the real you. And, and we are running a webinar on that as well. Top five tips to get into an accelerator. And we talk about that. 
don't good. hide don't hide yourself yeah and don't think your idea is so secret that you can't tell anybody because you I'm, should be able to tell people some part of your idea and if you really have secret parts then don't say those parts <laughs> yeah yeah and i'm a huge fan of joining accelerators so everyone should join barbara's uh webinar if you're early, if you're if you're early on and you have especially if you've never raised money for a company before never been a part of an accelerator you should definitely join one and if you have yeah. joined one and been a part of one and it was a good one you will do it every single time you start a company no matter what network you have already because it's a good idea like if i start another company right now I'd make a call to one of two accelerators, depending on the industry, immediately. Even though I've met, uh, I've raised money for company before. I already have the connection. I already know the people running those accelerators, and mm -hmm. could ask them to just be our advisors. But I would join again because it makes a huge difference. It's that communal, that yeah. communal. Uh, uh, you know, you're doing yeah, it all together community. with the rest oh, of your cohort, right? You, you have a bunch of people that are in your similar position, dealing with similar problems that you're dealing with. Thank and you. you have those peers to lean on and feel no shame around because they're dealing with it too, right? So you, right. you have this just like great, great opportunity to accelerate literally your growth in addition to your business's growth because there's so many different perspectives and people around you from different walks of life, different, you know, perspectives and, and, and sets of values and ways of doing things that you're naturally going to be innovating too along the way because you have all these different people throwing things your way that you've never even considered before. So yeah, it's always a great, great, great opportunity for sure. For a lot more reasons than just access to some capital and investors. Right. It's, it's uh, the ecosystem and it's the relationships and it is this kind of shared uh, camaraderie in an accelerator that helps. So, so I think we're supposed to be wrapping up. Connor, yeah. what's up? What do we do? Is there <laughs> no, we kind of took over the whole thing. Uh, Barbara, when's that webinar happening? Uh, you can go onto this platform, Crowdcast slash Trail Invent, Trail Adventures, and look it up. It's like uh, on the replay. Oh, so you cool. have to like, there's ones that are happening, and then you can scroll down. And that the, the five, top five things. Because the most accelerators, so our accelerator is completely online now. It's completely virtualized. We have a complete community. Our alumni is there. We do have cohort in there. So we're running cohorts, and I'm doing kind of a little bit more um, uh, group uh, conversations uh, versus one-on-one. -on -one. So that's how we've adjusted it. But it's a full community. It's almost like Facebook in there. It's quite amazing. So we go over that as well. Like, what does the community look like? Who's in there? What do we do in there? How do you apply? Stuff like that. Cool. Uh, Alon and Gary, any other links or things you want to share uh, that you're doing or interesting things you found? Yeah, um, I just posted a link. Uh, I've got two in there. So every week we do a community check-in. It's just real informal. Come share what you're working on, what you might need help with. And as a community, whoever's there, we'll try to like you know provide some guidance. And then I post another link to a workshop that we do every other week to help people with practicing their, their pitch, running through their presentation, and getting some feedback on their pitch deck. So yeah, we do a couple of little things, but those are the two key ones. So definitely uh, come, come hang out with us. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah, and I'll just throw out there, if you uh, or someone you know is an early stage blockchain startup, um, come uh, pitch us, uh, drapergorenholm.com. And if you sign up to the newsletter there, then you'll you'll get all the stuff for all of our events and things like that. But um, if uh, please, if you're an early stage blockchain company, uh, we like to be the first check. So we want to we I want. Have, to, I have three there a lot. I have three. I had three come out of the cohort this time. So yeah, so they were so, good. They were very good. These ones are amazing. These ones are really good. I was like, wow, these ones are good. It's a cool industry because it's such mm -hmm. a roller coaster that uh, essentially all the people who came in because of the hype have left at various times and the smartest yeah. people uh, are still around and some incredible uh, entrepreneurs are in the space. But yeah. um, feel free to reach out, uh, happy to help. Um, more uh, professionalized. I think it's gotten a little bit more professionalized. Oh, for sure. Blockchain space. Yeah. Blockchain space. We lost Gary. 
Yeah, Gary, Gary is gone. So hey guys, Gary is at 805startups.com. So uh make sure to sign up to the newsletter in there. Gary's in the chat. He's in the chat. Um it's uh it's it's all good. Um Connor, where do we find you? Um I have uh what's well, a good place? Uh, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm working on a few projects. Uh, one's uh, antiviral masks, another one for uh, medicine mobility. We're working on at home test kits for COVID and other things. Um, our websites are kind of uh, hacked together, but it's uh, yeah, okay. mobility.com and virusapp.com. That's what it is. Nice. Well, good luck, man. And, good uh, luck, yeah. Great. Great to uh, see everyone and uh, see you all soon. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, uh, Alan, Gary, and Barbara for speaking. Thank you, Anytime. so much. Thank you. Have a good, have a good one. You too.